What up, though? I'm Jay Hall, represent AURN. And this is something real special because Unsung presents the decades where they're breaking down the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and 2000s. But right here, I'm sitting here with a legend that I personally grew up on, my man Money B. Hello to you, good sir. I'm good, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah. First of all, how's your well-being? I'm asking everybody this because, you know, everything we've been going through since the 2020 sequels. Well, it's a little crazy because um, tomorrow is actually the one-year anniversary of the past of Chad G. So, you know, I'll, you know it's, it's, it's a time of reflection right now, for sure. Yeah, it. I know it has to feel a certain more deeper way for you because it definitely felt a way about me because it felt like for me it came out of nowhere um, because I always felt like Shock G was one of those musical geniuses, at least from my point of view, that people still don't recognize the genius on the national scale as much as it much as they should because of how much he touched musically. Yeah, he was a, he was a, he was a, a genius musician. I'm not sure a lot of people know that because because of how popular the Humpty Dance was and you know how polarizing he was with the nose and everything. But uh, he's definitely, you know, I always tell people he, he's, he's your favorite producer's favorite producer in a lot of things. Does that, how do you feel about taking on that mantle? Because before Shock G's, <clears throat> I seen, you were always being asked about, you know, Tupac. You know, and that's you know, that's that's something people always because I always felt like you and Tupac was one of the most underrated one two punches on music. But you know, mm -hmm. as his personality grew, people always want to ask you, <clears throat> you know, shock G about him. How does that weigh on you now <clears throat> ask about both of these two legends that are no longer with us physically? Um I mean I'm Bill Ford, and you know, and, and to mention also another one of our members, Smooth Smooth, actually passed shortly after. Um, after uh, shot pass last year, and you know, even before then, as far as digital underground, you know, I was, I people would say that you know, I was probably the heart and soul of the group that was, you know, kind of keeping the legacy alive. Anyway, because because for the last few years, um, even before shots passing, he was kind of like on a Hiatus. That's why he introduced me and sent Young Hump to me. Right. So you guys continue it while I kind of sit in the back and figure out what I want to do. Right. So I had been carrying the mantle even years before Shot Pass. But um, you know, when it comes to to talking talking about his life or Tupac's life, I guess I was kind of grown for it because for so many years everybody wants to know about Tupac. You know, and now it's, it's Tupac and Shot. I don't, I don't mind um, sharing and, 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 and making sure that I keep both of those names going as long as I can. That's good. That's good. And I mean, it shows the importance of having good people around you because, you know, us in our community, our storytelling and passing on these stories, that's what makes us so great. As, but it didn't occur to me until I got older just how much these stories and how important they are. Like I got grandfathers that I personally never met, but I can recite their story in detail. And I feel like you've yeah. always been that for Digital Underground, even before, like you said, you were always that vocal piece. And you always seem to be a piece that everybody got along with. Like there's no issues about right. Money B at all. None whatsoever. Right. You know, when you think about the decades, cause I think about Sex Packets and when it dropped right on 1990, this seemed to be a shift right there from the 80s? I mean, like an immediate shift. Was that intentional on you all's part as you was working on music? Were you just having that vibe or was that something you said, this is what we gonna go in and do? Well, it was amazing, you know, with us is because we were, you know, two, two parts of it. In our minds, we were emulating our heroes, right? Who were the ones that came before us, you know, I, I grew up loving Run DMC and, and Two Live Crew and, and Shop was a huge fan of Slick Rick and EPMD and at that time, you know, at that time we were recording um, Sets Packets, which came out in 90, 
you know, I was listening to a lot of, um, you know, the Jungle Brothers and, and uh, uh, what was that? EPMD. Shock love EPMD. You know, you know, I, I loved two live groups. So you think of a song like, you know, the Humpty Dance. Some it's some slick rick in in the way that Humpty dressed, you know, his style and his his arrogance. When me and Shock would play off each other, you know, in our mind we were doing the EPMD or R&B and C thing. You know, and even in the song Fruits of the Industry, or even I get around, you know. What's up, Bob? How you doing? You know, a dime and a nickel. I was I, I was emulating the Jungle Brothers because they would kind of ad lib each other so well, and I always loved the way they did that. So that's why, you know, I made it a point. Every, you know, in every song, I, you know, got nasty and, and doing all of that stuff. So it wasn't like we said we're going to change it and do it different. Well, the thing with us was coming out of the Bay Area in Oakland. You know, you had MC Hammer, you had uh, Tony, 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 um, and Too Short, right? But there was no one to tell us specifically how to do it. So we just kind of freestyled. We didn't have any, like, this is the way that you, mm-hmm. this is how an MC is supposed to act. This is what a rap group is supposed to do. We didn't have anybody to tell us. We weren't in New York or LA where there was labels and a bunch of groups and people were being groomed to do it. We did it all ourselves. We did it. We didn't have anybody telling us a specific way to do it. So we just kind of did what we like. You know, we did it how we felt. And you know, the the just the vibe of the Bay Area and where we came from came from kind of reflected in our music. I think. So it wasn't intentional, but we sure didn't have any direction. And that's maybe why we were a little different. But we weren't trying to. We weren't trying to change it. Like, we didn't think it was anything broken in 80s hip-hop that we had to fix. We would just come in. It was just our interpretation of what we love. Yeah, I don't know if too many people know this. So I'm born and raised in Detroit. So you guys come out of Oakland. You know Detroit, Oakland always had that connection for some strange reason. And it's one of those small things not too many people know of that. So when I saw Humpty put the, you know, the coat over the shoulders, I gravitated that more towards than I did Slick Rick because they were looking like everybody I stepped on my front porch with. And I don't, I have no idea why a city so far from me. And I grew up hearing about these connections because it was about music. And when you talk about influence, I, you know, the first thing I think about is Sons of the P because you mentioned all of the, you know, your counterparts, your rappers that was all at the same time. But for, you know, for my era, when I was coming up elementary school, you guys were our kind of funkadelic, our parliament that our parents were playing. And the one thing I used to love about it, you never really knew when you play a whole digital ground, underground album where the song ended began and had this nice instrumentation that would kind of just like pick up right after that. And I always, you know, say admired that. And your voice is often, sometimes I feel like I don't get credited being used as an instrument because not only would you rap on it, but I can hear you kind of come in on that one, two punch. Was that something you guys figured out when you was freestyling one day or like shock heard your voice and say, Hey, this is what I need you to do. Well, that was, you know, that was one of the, the geniuses of Shock G because he, he did use all of our voices like instruments. You know, he would say, so it wasn't like he wouldn't take Sons of the Peace, that album specifically, you know, when we were recording it, he called me into the studio. It wasn't like, hey, I saved you a verse. It was like, hey, man, I need you to say something for two bars here. Say mm-hmm. something for four bars here. Here is where I need a verse, but wait, take that out and say that here and say it a little mellower. You know what I mean? Like he would, he actually produced my vocals because he did use my vocals sort of like an instrument. And we would layer them under, weave them in between other vocal tones and, and certain melodies to get the specific sound that he, that he heard in his head. And for me, you know, as an MC, I was just like, whatever, right? You know, I thought I thought I was going to go. Anyway, so I didn't care how he used it. So I would just go and do whatever he asked me to do. And I wasn't really, I didn't really care where it led it or how much he used. I know he could use something if he asked me to do it. So, you know, it would always be interesting to me when the song was done. 
where I was used and how he used it, or, you know, how he mixed it and things like that. Um, yeah, though, it felt like it sounds like you're comparing it to how actors are when they do a movie. A lot of times they have to go to the premiere to actually know what the movie, you know, if they're going to like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you just do just scenes and pieces. Yeah, you just go in and do it. Do scenes and pieces. And then you see what what it turns out to be. Like I remember one time, um, you know, I went to, he called me to the studio. This was doing some of the piece. And I get to the studio, you know, George Clinton's there and all Parliament, Mike, Mike Hampton and and all of them, they just all laid around and it just that was like, 420 before 420 for real. Yeah, it really was. They were just kicking it. And I just went and I was like, what the hell y'all doing? And, but I but I just but we were working on that song, the, the actual song Sons of the Peace. And I just remember going in and just the whole vibe of the session was, was dope. And I just kind of went in and just did what I did. And to, you know, that's one of my favorite. Visual Underground songs you know, to this day, just the, the way we put that thing together and just the, the, the vibe of the studio that day. Because you had like the, you know, us bringing this new funk, but you had the original Funketeers, you know, Uncle George and, and all the original guys that were mm -hmm. here and they were like cheering us on. You know, they were super supportive and, um, and they appreciated us keeping the funk alive. So it wasn't like we were, you know, they didn't, George didn't look at shots as if he was. Hip hop dude sampling funk. He looked at Shock as like creating and I was happy to be a part of that for sure. Yeah, I feel like that era in particular in the nineties, a lot of the pioneers and you all that was out, you gave us a reason to go back. So now I'm, you know, I'm hearing about this influence and I'm going back. So I kind of was getting extra history lessons where I even realizing it through the music of that because mm -hmm. it was always a, a tribute whether it was intentional or unintentional and I felt like the masses at that time not George Clinton but you know those that were upset at sampling and and you know because in that era it was the rap is crap era and not understanding the tribute that you all were paying to the people that you had grew up listening to because that was significant for me because the George Clinton and all of them that was before my time but now here I am listening to their records because of you all you know right. Do you ah. feel that it can be like that for you all? Like, cause I, I, from what I hear, you know, a lot of people are sampling now. They're kind of going back to that. Just in the past, maybe three years, I've been hearing, you know, like I hear a Mary J. Bly song, I think it's coming on and it's not a Mary J. Bly song. You know, do you think there's a time right. that, <laughs> that's going to happen where people are going to reference back to digital underground? You know what I mean? Cause well, you they, I mean, they're, they're doing it, they're doing it now. And I'll give you a prime example. Um, there's an artist um, out of out of Oakland. Um, his name is Rob Dad. Four thousand. I'm not sure if you've heard of him. Okay. Um, he's, he's he's pretty you know he's he's pretty big for the younger generation. Um, but uh, he he remade Fruits of the Industry, right? Him and I forget another artist, and you know they had to clear it with us, and when. When he, when he, when, you know, he sent it to Shock and he sent it to me. Um, when I heard it, I was like, wow. But, you know, because a lot of times people just take the sample and they're kind of lazy and they kind of want to do the same song over. Oh, I'm going to remake Kiss You Back or Humpy Day. But he kind of reimagined it in a way. I was like, wow, this is fresh. I like it. And without even having the conversation, Shock heard it and he loved it so much that he he gave it to him. Like, he didn't even want to charge him for for. Oh wow! You know, he's like, "Well, this is dope. Go ahead." Um, but what ended up happening, I think that they, um, the Don Donna Summers people, didn't clear it. I think they're still trying to get it, get it clear. But you know, I just say that to say, like, you know, I'm totally into, to, you know, the next generation or the younger generation, you know, using our music because that's what we did, right? And if they're clever and, and original and they add their own twist on it and then it helps introduce it to the next generation because like you said they'll hear it and when they find out it came from something they'll go back and listen to the original you know even if it's just one time right so i get that one one spin 
<laughs> yeah, because I feel like there was a, a maybe a 10 year period where it wasn't that, but now it is that now, you know, it was, it didn't feel like there was a period where there was a reason and that could be coming from streaming or whatever, where a young listener didn't have a reason to really go back. Now I feel like they do. I got little homies that ask me like, yo, I didn't know this song was such and such. And it's, you know, I'm, I'm of age now. So I'm thinking like, oh man, now this song is considered ancient now. You know what I mean? But this was pretty much yeah. my development. I give you, I give you a prime example, right? And so you'll get a kick out of this. Like my my son is actually from Detroit, so I'm you know I'm okay. I'm, what up, though? Know, you know I'm all through here. What up, though? <laughs> you know, out there in um Inkster and, and all of that. You know, okay. I'm, I'm, you know, one of my business partners is actually in Troy. You know, I talk to every day, so you know I'll be out there. But um, I remember when he was he was a kid. And that song that he put up, tell me when to go. Dum, dum. Right, right. He had no idea that that was a sample. It's a dumb, dumb. And when I played Dumb Girl by Run DMC, it blew his mind. But he instantly, instantly became a Run DMC fan because he started checking out the older stuff. And so, you know, I imagine that that will happen, you know, with our music especially. Yeah, let me find out because one of my first time part time jobs was in uh, was in Troy. Let me find out. I would have saw Money B walking through Troy, Michigan. <laughs> you would have definitely saw me walking through. The right, a few miles past. You know what I mean? Working above a mile because that was only the time I can get a part time job because there wasn't no part time jobs. Well, you know, um, legal part time jobs outside. You know what I mean? Inside the city, so I had to go way out there for my first one out there by Oakland Mall, which I know you're familiar with. Yeah, I was. I was talking to my guy just before I jumped on this call. Actually. That's what's up. That's what's up. I know you said you mentioned how you were mostly about the rap, you know, coming from Raw Fusion. I saw you say that too on Drink Champs. How important was it that even though you were about the rap for Shock G to always kind of push you in that direction of thinking more in a musical sense or did you just completely trust him? Was there ever a time where y'all battled in that because you were so about, you know what I mean, just keeping the hip hop or you just totally trusted him? Well, um, there's a little bit of, of all of that, right? So say, um, the very first song that we recorded together was What You Like, right? And initially, I wasn't a huge fan of that song just because I thought that the, um, I thought the drums were a little soft, right? You know, I, I, I came from that, you know, 808. And the then, boom back, right? And, <laughs> the boom, yeah, the boom back. Yeah. And, and, but, you know, the drums weren't as important to him as how he layered the samples and the melodies and, and just the, the structure of the song. That's what he... And a piano. I don't remember no yeah, hip-hop he, songs having the pianos yeah, in them back then. He was the pian yeah, he was the piano man. So all of that was, was what he was concentrating on. And I just thought, yeah, you know what I mean? But he was like, trust me, it's going to work. And I was like, all right. But I wasn't really eager to, to do a lot on that song. And that's why, like, I think I'm on, like, eight or 12 bars. Like, I could have I, I could have been on more of the song, but I just really, I didn't understand it at the time. And that was our very first time working together. And, you know, but as I got to, to, to know him, and I'm not working together, because we had been doing shows before we started recording. Before we okay. got the deal, we were kind of moving around together, but it was more of a, of a, a live performance and just kind of brainstorming type deal. But to actually go in the studio, that was the first time, right? And then as we did it more and we started recording, I got and learned him a little more. Then I just trusted his vision because it was his vision. You know, like I said, we, we myself and DJ Fuse's Raw Fusion, we were brought in to, to add that um, raw hip hop element that we brought to the table. And he brought, you know, he brought that, that all of the funk that he had in inside of himself, the musicianship and, and all of that. That's what he brought to the table. So we kind of trusted each other. That's why we could say, Mun, go do something instead of Mun, let me hear what you wrote. Let me do the good. Mm, okay. Let's do it. You know, in the same way. He's like, I did it. I'll come in and I hear it. I'll be like, okay. And then I'll go and do what I need to do. Same way, fuse when you just come in and lay you know, some scratches on it. And you come in and, 
and at his part. So it was, it was just like a, it was like a we were like a big production team, a collective. So we weren't we were never singular minded or everybody. It wasn't like we grew up together and we had we came from the same background and we, we thought the same way. We were all very different, and that's what kind of made it because we we were just at our parts. And then sh shocked as a mad scientist, he would make it make sense after we, you know, threw everything in the pot, stir it up, and the dumbo. I, I talked about how I felt like you were probably one of the best whenever you were on a track, either with Shock G or Pop, one, two punches in hip hop that I still don't feel like gets no respect. And the song that I always refer to is not necessarily I Get Around, because that's a classic within itself. It's Call It What You Want. You know, mm -hmm. um, it took me a Kill minute. That song. It took me a minute to realize that that was not you two song. Like it took, it took me a second as a kid growing up, like, oh, this is above the law. You know what I mean? With, when people refer to that era of the 90s being the, the golden era, you know, that 88 from arguably 98 or 01, did you know within that time y'all were living in something special or creating something special? Like were you looking at pot to the right, kind of like, yo, we on something? Or could you understand that moment? Nah, man, we were just doing it, you know, because uh, by, you know, by, think about it, 90, when, by the time me and Pac first released our, our, our respective solo albums, right? So um, I remember we were recording the Raw Fusion album, Sons of the G, Tupacalypse Now, mm. and Gold Money was another group that was out of our camp signed the time we were. We were all recording our albums those albums at the same time. So we had um, Starlight Studio in Richmond, California. We had it blocked out 24 hours for two months. And we were just, you know, nonstop, you know, every eight hours a new crew would come in, but we would just hang out and be in each other's studio sessions. So we were um, present basically for all of those albums being made at the same time. Mm. But also remember at that time, we were all, you know, in 90, you know, I was, depending on the time of the year, I was either 21 or just turning 22 years old. You know, I'm just now getting my first apartment. And, you know, and, and girls are like, I mean, they always do. You know. As a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you but know, now you had a place though. Place. Now you had a place. Yeah, and out of place, right? Yeah. But, but, so, all of this stuff is just happening. You know, we record now, we gotta go back home. We didn't have a time, I never had a time to sit back and breathe and think about it because we were just doing it. You know, we were, just, we were doing it, we were young and, and, and we had been doing it since we were like 18, 19 years old. So it just seems like this is what we do. So we didn't know, you know, 30 years later that people would look back on it or whatever. We just were having fun making music. What was something- I honestly never thought about it in that way. Yeah, what, what was something that you would say, um, because I don't know if a lot of artists today know some of the things that you artists of the 90s were going through, especially when they were trying to take rap out all together, like trying to take hip hop out all together. I mean, we talking about running over CDs and you know, trying to get laws passed. I, I mean, these kids, they would have no idea how thankful they are for the culture because now it's, you like an idiot trying to do that now in a sense, or the noise isn't as loud. But it it felt like, I can tell you as a fan, as a kid, it felt like they were very close to taking it away. You know what I mean? Right. We, it it right. felt that way. Was it, did you have that defensiveness about that culture or that era within that? Did you guys understand that? Or were you were just, as far as the digital underground, was you just like, we're just going to do us? Nah, nah we, we definitely, and even on the road, you know, we would go, you know, you had the Bible belts. You know, Ooh. in the South in certain cities where you would get arrested, you know, like they considered doing a Humpty dance as gyrating. Are you saying, you're like, talking about the end part? Like, yeah, they're like, you can't do that dance. So they literally would, would have cops on the side of the stage, like if you guys do that dance, you're going to jail. Uh, and Kid and Play, you know, we weren't told Kid and Play. Kid and Play used to do a lot of dance. So they were trying to outlaw the dancing part of it. Um, and we would go to certain cities and there would be protests in, in front of venues and, and 
us as a hip hop community, we kind of had to stick together. So it didn't matter, you know, where you were from or what coast or what city, because it was, you know, anytime the press on tour with, with, um, you know, Public Enemy, Kid and Play, uh, you have um, us, Sir Mix a lot from Seattle, and we'd be doing shows with the Ghetto Boys, and you know, and you know, Moni Love on tour with with Batista. No matter who it was, we would all eat dinner in the same cafeteria at the venue together. And when we were in each city, we knew that we had to look out for each other. You know what I mean? Because you know, in order for us to, to keep this thing alive, you know, we had to make sure that. No incidents happened. You know, nobody got badly hurt um, at any of these venues. None of us did any, you know, broke any laws, got in any trouble. Anything that that they could come down on the culture and blame the culture, we were very cognizant to to represent the culture in in the correct manner. We were going to move through these towns and cities. And I have to give you know shout out. You know, one of the people that taught us that was Chuck D. Public Enemy brought us out um, in 1990 or 1991, I forget. Mm-hmm. But it was one of our first tours with Big Daddy Kane, our first U.S. tour, then Public Enemy. But Chuck was one that really sat us down and told us about this and how we got to move this and how we got to I took that with me forever. I'm visualizing that right now, and I'm like, man, that's that's a that's a beautiful sight to have all of you sit down and Chuck D kind of leading that charge of understanding that moment. I only got like a couple more questions, but one I got, I have to ask you now that you're an adult adult and you have a son, do you look back on that area with the C. Dolores Tuckers and all of them? And do you feel like there was a part of them that was right about, you know, the violence or the misogyny of music, even though that may or may not have been what digital underground was about, but like you said, just being part of hip hop as a collective, do you see it now? Or do you still sit back and say, no, nah, they were wilding? They were wrong. Okay. Um, you know, because what they did was they, they they attacked the culture as a whole, as opposed to, you know, addressing the issues, the problems. You know, they would say someone, you know, a man murdered somebody in Texas, and he said because he was listening to Tupac. But well, now it's Tupac. That's, mm-hmm. not you, that's not you, that's not how you address the issue, you know. And let's look at myself now. I'm of the age that they were back then, and I see, you know, there's still senseless things happen, especially with social media. But I don't sit here and say, you know, because this rapper got murdered, that all rap should be destroyed. That doesn't make sense, you know. Let's, let's figure out what's happening with this people or what's happening with our people and let's try to start from let's start within ourselves. What are we doing wrong? As opposed to pointing the finger and blaming blaming somebody. I'll, I'll, I'll never do that. Yeah, I agree. And especially as acting as if hip hop started all that when you had just around the corner or before that the 80s glam band rockers were doing all that and then some and it didn't seem like they were trying to get no laws passed. I mean maybe a couple but not to the point of trying to take out a whole culture, like you said. That was the part that didn't sit well with me. Even, even though some old I look back on, that was the part that probably still doesn't sit well with me either, but just wanted to know. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know the argument was, you know, you know, these kids are are, you know, hip hop is wild as well. You know, it wasn't. It was just that was the music that um inner city kids were listening to. So, you know, if there's violence in our community, if we were if we were all fans of of golf and all the inner city kids were on golf courses, that's where the violence would be. Then golf would be the violent sport, right? It, it's not the sport, it's not the music, it's who, you know, it's who's, who's, um, who's participating. And so it, you can't blame the clothes, you can't blame the music, you can't blame the movie. You know, we, we have to look within ourselves and the problems within our community. Like, what's happening there? Why are our kids growing up with such hatred towards each other? You know, why are we, you know, let's get to the bottom of it, you know, and not look for a scapegoat. When you think about that era in particular, 
when it comes to what Shock G and, you know, when what Pac did and all of that. And you look at it now, like you said, with your son, and I'm pretty sure you see his friends and all of that. What's something that you would like to keep carrying on from that era? Something that you all started that you would like to see keep going? Um, you know, I, I just always appreciate creativity. You know, hip hop has always been a, a, a youth driven, <clears throat> a youth driven movement. You know, it started out with kids, you know, us kind of taking what we had and, and creating what we could, you know. We, you know, we, we grew up, we, we, we couldn't afford instruments and all of that, right? But there were ter- turntables. So we, we took what we had and, and cheap drum machines and we created this, this new thing. Now, you know, I love that. Um, well, it's, it's sort of like a gift and a curse. So now these kids have technology at their hand. So they can do anything from their phones and from their laptops and everything like that. And it's interesting to just to see how they interpret, you know, the music now. You know, it may not be some of it, a lot of it is not for me, but that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be doing it because if they're making it for them, they're not making it for me. You know, I didn't, I didn't make, I didn't make, uh, call it what you want for my mom and her friends. <laughs> you know, they were, they were listening, they were listening to Temptations and Whispers and all of that stuff. So yeah. I have to, you know, I gotta keep that same energy. You know, when I hear young kids, I'm like, well, <laughs> but if I if 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 I did get it, then they're doing something wrong. Because if they're not supposed to be doing it, then <laughs> you know, I, I like some of it, but you know, I, I, I support creativity and I support um, you know young people doing things positive, and I think for the most part, making music is doing something. Yeah, and it's also good too because even though they're exploring and they're doing th- new things, a lot of it's still mm-hmm. nothing new under the sun. Because I mean, I, I look back on the "Do What You Like" video and I watched the end end part. That that part's still wild to me, even as a grown man. You know what I mean? With the little censorship mm-hmm. under the pool, you know what I'm saying? Like I'm like, ah, yo, the stuff that we, they, we got away with back then, you would get fried for it right now. So on one end, it's, oh, it's man, that. So glad there was no social media. Yo, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I'm glad mm-hmm. that they kind of got their own thing because some things don't need to be repeated. They need to be kind of, you know, stay where they were. Right. Um, for the most yeah. part, yo. So no, I like to thank you, um, Money B, for taking your time. You know. Um, my love and heart goes to you during this reflection period, as you mentioned earlier. You know, much love to Shock G, who was one of the GOAT producers of all time. Oh, you know what else we too? I wanted to say when we were talking about carrying things forward. So, and, and one, you know, I'm even learning from what's going on in new technology because even, you know, our next single is actually going to be an NFT music drop. You know? Okay. So, you know, I've been heavy into that side of things. And NFT music and just, you know, releasing music on the blockchain and, and, and controlling the rights to all of our music. And, and I'm all about um, financial literacy and kind of sharing that information with, you know, people, you know, people, our people, the black and brown communities, making sure that they. Yeah, I saw that, that you got real big into that, you know. Yeah. I saw that you got real big into um, that. Cause one thing about from the area, like you say, everybody was young. You had your young apartment at 21, but now that you're, you know, you're wiser and you real big about talking about the finances that just conversations we just wasn't having in our community. Where can we yeah. go to hear you talk more about that? Um, you know, I would, I would follow me on Twitter or Instagram at moneyb69. Okay. You know, moneyb and then the numbers. Six times, I think it is. But um, and uh, but yeah, so you know, I'm always on there. You know, we, we you know, as we start to roll out this um this campaign for this next single, but I'm also like I said, I'm just big and, and sharing the information. So if you follow me there, you can DM me or join any of the Twitter Spaces that that I do or IG lives that I do, and I'm always you know kind of sharing the information, or or I will have guests that can share the information. So if you want to learn about it, just, you know, anything web for me um, about the blockchain and the you know, hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at moneyb69. And 
I like hearing you know, that. And for, and for people that are already in the state, you know, join the DUHQ Discord channel. Yeah, I like hearing that. I like hearing my seasoned rappers as we get older still making adult, you know, hip hop, but also like to see the other things that they're expanding on because as you get older, you start to care about these things, you know. You have to start caring about finance and you, you have to start learning how to read contracts or, you know, getting to new spaces that are about financial improvement for our community because we just wasn't having those conversations back then. And, you know, that was another thing that I didn't like, you know, not to tag on that, but I love that what you're doing right now because it didn't seem like a lot of the elders were trying to counsel. Some of they were more criticized. There were a few that were, and much respect to those that do. So I'm loving the fact that you're part of the, you know, seasoned veteran MCs that are actually taking part in that conversation of how we can be more educated when it comes to that in our culture. Yeah, man. I mean, I, you know, each one, teach one. Because if we don't, then it'll be lost, right? You know, you know I hear a lot of people from my generation who's complaining about, you know, this sucks, this is bad. Well, you know, if we don't show them or support them, the divide will keep getting bigger. Because we're yeah. telling they suck, and they're telling us we're old, we don't understand. And it doesn't doesn't really have to be that. So, um, because a lot of, you know, from what I find out, um, a lot of younger artists in general, they do want to know. They want to learn. They want to know what it was like. They want, they want us to share that information. But they feel like we don't respect them. So that's why they kind of turn their nose at us. But, you know, we have to meet each other at some point and bring it together. Because, you know, if we don't, and, and if we let them fully interpret without giving them any history, it'll eventually get them lost. Yeah, I agree. Thank you very much. Um, much love to TV One for about this when it comes to decades. Unsung decades, make sure you check it out on TV One. I'm definitely going to check out more about it. You can check out Money B that's on there. Good, sir. I appreciate you sharing your time and dropping the gems that you dropped. Absolutely.